Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is John Halligatway from the Met Plus team. Um, I'll be starting kicking off the, the presentations this morning. Um, I'm sharing my screen and I uh, want to direct you to the agenda page for this training series. So I'll copy and paste this link into the into the uh, chat here so it's easy to grab. Um, Julie, you know, in, in about 10 minutes or a few minutes, we repaste that link for, for those people who have joined in the meantime. So um, I'm going to go here to the agenda page. We're currently on session eight. That's what we're presenting today. I'll scroll down here to session eight. There's a little expandable window here. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about the PB to NC tool. And after me, Julie will be doing a, a, a hands-on exercise for PB to NC. Uh, then Dan Adrianson will be talking about the ASCII to NC tool along with Python embedding for point data and, and then uh, doing a hands-on as well. So we're going to try to fit that all in the, this hour. Um, these links, uh, you know, the PB to NC and ASCII to NC presentation link take, are, are links that take you to the PDF for the slides we're presenting. So if you'd like to follow along, if, it, if it's easier to look at a PDF, then feel free to d download those and, and look at them yourself. So um, I am going to fire up PowerPoint and talk for the first uh, about 10 minutes or so about PB to NC. Um, so let's get going. First off, uh, Tara, can you confirm that you can see, can you see the, the presentation or can you see the, uh, the notes page? I see your slides, John. You see the, you see the slides. Okay, thank you. Okay, so yeah, I'm John Halligatway talking about the PBNC tool. Um, here is the overview of MET version 10.0.0, the, the version that we're using uh, in this for this this training series. And you know, this each one of these ovals is one of the one of the tools within MET. And today I'm talking about the buffer point data. So the, so the gray boxes on the left are data sources, data files. And um, so we're, we're reading buffer point data into the PB to NC tool, that little oval, and generating a point NetCF output file. We do that so that we can input that NetCF output file into the statistics tools in MET. Specifically, point stat and on ensemble stat are two tools that process point observations. The plot point ops tool shown to the bottom right of the um, of the NetCF point obs is, is another tool that can process the point observation data to just uh, visualize it. PB to NC stands for prep buffer to NetCDF. So the, the functionality of the tool is basically read in observations from the input binary prep buffer and buffer point, uh, files, filter them down based on message type, observation type, so observation variable type, time, a uh, certain time and location, their lat long location. It also can derive a handful of new observation types from the inputs. It can compute time summaries. So for example, the min, maximum, or average value at each, at each station over some time window. It writes its output to this intermediate NetCF point observation format that the other ensemble, that the other tools like ensemble stat and point stat read. And there's a configuration file uh, that is required to define all these filters and time summary information. Uh, you usually run PV to NC once for each valid time that you're evaluating. So for example, if you are running MET plus in a real time mode uh, and you have the observations the, available for today, for this valid time, you would run PV to NC once and then you might verify multiple forecasts that are all valid at, at the current time. So buffer is a World Meteorological Organization standard binary code for the representation and exchange of observational data. So um, that, that being said, um, most researchers that, I, that I'm aware of don't generate their own buffer or prep buffer files. Um, prep buffer is a format produced by NOAA uh, EMC for an analysis and data simulation. So it's very similar to buffer with additional um, uh, data stored in, in the file. So um, what we often do in the DTC is grab a buffer or prep buffer data from NOAA and use it for systematic evaluation of, of forecast models. 
Um, but I, I realized that uh, it, it, it certainly isn't a very uh, user-friendly file format. And Dan will be talking about Ask it NC, which is a lot more accessible. Um, so right now, our support for buffer and prep buffer data is limited to those files that contain embedded tables. Um, ECMWF buffer files generally use external tables, which is not currently supported in MET. There, I've listed there a link to a development issue um, for, to, to add that feature, but it is uh, it it's it's under development, but um, not uh, not imminent. So here's a usage statement for PBNC. I I'll, I won't spend too long on this. Um, I just want to highlight that you know you just pretty simple. You say here is the name of the prep buffer file that I want to process. Here's the output netcdf file that I want to create, and here's my configuration file. If you want to process more than one prep buffer file in a single call to the tool, you can pass additional ones using the dash pb file command line argument. Um, if you want to explicitly define the retention time window, so you know buffer prep buffer files usually contain multiple hours worth of observations. And if you want to limit, you know, define the time window to retain, you can explicitly specify that on the command line, or use the, um, or or define it in the configuration file. Um, of these, I'll skip over these other ones. Other than I want to mention, I, I think I go into more detail about the dash index option on the next slide. So if you want to see, you know, you you have a prep buffer file, and you want to see what this file actually contains. I'd recommend running the running it with the dash index option. What that does is it goes through and reads reads through all the messages and prints out this sort of uh, information to the to the log output. So it basically says for um, you know the for each observation type like QOB is specific humidity, TOB is a temperature observation. So for, it lists out the observations variables that are available and the corresponding message types uh, in which they appear. So this doesn't actually produce a usable NetCDF output file. It just inventories the input file. So you would run this once, look at the data inventory, and then set up your configuration file accordingly. So what are the things, what are what are the options contained in the config file? So um, this this is not this list is not exhaustive. If you want more information, I'll refer you to this link, which is to the, the user's guide um, to the configuration section. In the user's guide, um, I would, in general, when you set up your PB to NC configuration file, I would recommend not over filtering. Um, so, if, if there's any OBS that you even want to consider using in your verification, just go ahead and include it in the PB to NC filtering step, um, because when you run point set and ensemble set, you can you always have the option of filtering them down, filtering the observations down by time, type, and location more there, uh, but you know, if you know, for example, if you're dealing with a global uh, global data set, and you know that you're only going to do your evaluation over the continental United States or over India, um, then go ahead and subset them spatially just to make the files smaller. But if you you know if you consider using any any OBS, then I'd encourage you to include them in your run of PBNC. So the message type is one important detail. Um, in, in prep buffer files, um, the each observation is associated with a message type. So uh, in these mnemonics, ADP SFC means surface land, SFC SHP is surface water, ADP UPA are upper air sounding observations, and then these other ones, aircraft, air car, mesonet, and profiler. You can you can guess they their their names are pretty self-explanatory. So in general, when you do verification and point stat and ensemble stat. Um, the statistics are typically computed separately for each message type. So you can filter the, the OBS by the message type. If you leave the configuration option empty, then it will retain all available ones. Um, let me go back here. Same uh, with the station ID. Usually you would keep it empty unless, there, unless you're doing some uh, testing and you want to see the values for a single station, you could explicitly list one or more station IDs to retain. Each, each prep buffer file has a center time, and the OBS window defines a uh, retention time window relative to that center time. You can subset them spatially in the mass dictionary. Um, each observation has an integer quality, quality control th uh, value, and the quality mark threshold is the maximum one, uh, indicates the maximum one for the ones you want to retain. In, in, in uh, prep buffer files, lower quality control values are better. 
Now the OBS buffer list are the, is the list of variables to be retained or derived. When you, if you look at that list, you'll see that some of them begin with D underscore, and those indicate the variable types that can be derived. So for example, D underscore wind is the wind speed as derived from the, the U and V observation values. And then OBS prep buffer map is a mapping of input variable names to output names. So you, you would request that you want D underscore wind uh, retained, but you would probably not want that as the observation variable name in the output. Instead, let's just call it wind so that we can support consistency between the forecast and observation naming conventions. The time summary dictionary um, enables you to define, summarize OBS at each station through time. So in this example here, I've enabled the time summary options by setting the flag to true. I've said, you know, I don't want to actually write the raw observation values. I only want to write the time summary values. They, you know, these details are can be a little confusing. The idea here is that um, the time step is basically the number of seconds between uh, time summary reports. And so here we want to do it that uh, compute compute a time summary every 24 hours. And the width defines the time the retention time window relative to that time step. So here I'm saying um, for the previous 24 hours, I want to compute the minimum and maximum temperature value. So if you run this, uh, so these settings would get you basically the min and max temperature every day at each station. And the time summary information is indicated in the computed message type. So let's say you have temperature observations of these two message types. You'll see this stuff appended to the end of it to indicate that this was a time summary obs that was computed. Note that you need enough input observations to actually summarize. So if you were going to actually compute a 24-hour summary, it would probably require four or more um, input prep buffer files to be processed. And that's the end of my slides for PV to NC. Um, Julie, I will hand it off to you. And while you're getting set up, Julie, I'll, I'll check to see if there's any quick questions that I can answer now. Thank you, John. I'm going to go ahead and switch the screen sharing. So I see there's a question. Does PV to NC also work with regular buffer data only for prep buffer? It does work for the, to my knowledge, uh, and Howard So is the developer who's the expert on this. It does work on the buffer files that are provided by um, by NCEP um, that have embedded tables. It does not work on the ECMWF buffer files that use external tables. Thanks, John. Okay, so for the hands-on session, we are going to walk through the. Um, MET plus use case. I'll go ahead and post the link to that in the chat in case you'd like to follow along. And so first we see this important note. If you're returning to the tutorial, you must source the tutorial setup script before running the following instructions. So we will go ahead and do that. As soon as I find my window, here we go. All right, so now our environment's all set up for this tutorial session. And this use case will utilize the MET PB to NC tool, but we will show it wrapped with MET plus. And so um, right here it says that the statistics created by this use case only dump the partial sum. So we will also be modifying the MET configuration file to add to the continuous statistics to the output. And there's, it says there's a little more setup in this use case, which, which will be instructive and demonstrate the basic structure. Um, we have here references to the MET plus users guide and the MET plus config glossary, which is handy if you're not familiar with some of the options. Um, but the first thing we're going to do is review the settings in the PB to NC config file. Okay, so going over these options in the MET plus config file, we can see that the only application we're going to run for this case is PB to NC, as specified here in the process list. We're going to loop by valid time, and we can see in the comments here that if it's set to valid or real time, we're going to need to set these options that are listed here. And right here, first we have the valid time format. And in this case, um, we see that this 
percent Y, percent M, percent D, percent H expands to be uh, the four digit year, two digit month, two digit day, and two digit hour. And that's the format we're gonna use for this case. So here we're specifying the format. And then as we go down further along, we're specifying the actual uh, begin time, valid begin time for this case, and the valid end time for this case. We have a valid increment. In this case, it's set to one minute. So we'll follow that. And then we have the lead sequence, which specifies the forecast lead times to include. In this case, we're just going to use zero. Here we are specifying the um, PB to NC offsets, which is the list of offsets in the prep buffer input file times to allow. In this case, we're just going to use 12. The loop order for this one, we're going to use processes um, and, and not times. So it says it will run the first wrapper in the process list for all time specified and then repeat it for the next item in the process list until all wrappers have been run. And again, in this case, it, we're just running the PBNC. Here it specifies the list or the location, excuse me, for the met config file. And in this case, it's the default to the PBNC config wrapped. And here it says um, PB to NC skip if output exists. It was set to true, but I changed it to false because I had tested this case ahead of time and I wanted it to uh, go ahead and recreate the output instead of not recreating the output so that we would run the full case again. So that's why I changed that. But your file will likely say true unless you changed it as well. Then we have the PB to NC window begin and window end. And as it says, these are the times relative to each input file's valid time. So this will be before that by um, negative 1800 seconds and after the end time of, of 1800 seconds. And here's where we're specifying the um, begin time and the end time formats. Um, you can see it was the same sort of format structure as above um, specifying that it's the valid time we want to use. And here we have settings um, for these, these settings will be uh, passed in to the met config file. And we've got PB to NC grid, poly, station ID, and message type, along with the PB report types, which are listed here. We've got the PB to NC level category. And so I say, gee, there's a bunch of numbers. I don't know exactly what those mean. So this is a good opportunity to take to go to the link that, for the, um, the MET user's guide in this case. And um, I went to the config options and searched for level category. And then here I can look and see exactly what those numbers mean. So that's where those are coming from. If you're not sure what it is, please uh, don't hesitate to use the documentation to find what you need. Then we've got the quality mark thresh. John spoke about that as well. And the OBS buffer var lists listed here. We've got time summary information below. And then um, you notice the switch to the uh, the dir section here. So now we've got all our directories listed. We've got the configdir um, showing using the parm base and the uh, pbdnc input dir using input base that we set previously in the um, the script that we sourced earlier. And then we've got pbdnc or actually I think the input base. I'm sorry, that's set in the metplus configuration. It's the output base that we set in the file that we sourced. And then here we've got the file name templates uh, so that the code knows exactly what to look for. And you can see here how they're specified using those same sort of format strings we saw previously, specifying the init and the offsets here. And then right here, this is the output template. So this is the output file name that will be specified when we run this case. All right, heading back to the tutorial section. We've reviewed that. Um, here it went over the directories as we talked about here as well. Um, this mentions that Parm base was set automatically by MET plus and that the wrapped config file for PB to NC is set relative to configdir as we as we saw um, right here. Okay, so now um, it says let's look at the PB to NC config file. And so the values for the MET tool, PB to NC are passed in from the MET plus config files. We're not going to go in detail and look at the at the config file, but we can see here um, that we are using the values that were specified in the met plus config file and the met config file. So we've set those in the met plus config file and then they're being used in the met config file in, in that manner right there. So it says right now we're not gonna make any modifications to the PB to NC met plus tool and we're just gonna go ahead and run the case. Should start seeing output here momentarily. Okay. 
So looking at the command line, we can see that um, we've got the run net plus script right here. And in it, we are passing to it the pb to nc comp file. Let's scroll back up. And uh, the, we've got the tutorial comp, which has our output base sets. And then we have, um, we're, we're setting the output base actually again on the command line. So we're overriding what we had previously, which is fine. Um, and then you can see the output from it plus where it says it's starting the configuration setup. It acknowledges here that it's overriding the output base with what we specified on the command line. It's giving you a, a bunch of information which you can check to verify paths here. And then we can see that it's here started running uh, the met plus command and the command that it used. Um, it specifies the log file here and it tells you what valid time clearly so that you can see what you're processing and make sure that, it, that it's accurate. It's always a good idea to take a look at the output to make sure that you're running exactly what you think you are. Um, it prints some of those variables we saw in the config file to the screen. And then it says at the end that it's successfully finished running. So that was a successful case. We can review the output file here. And we can see that our output file sample PB to NC was created. And that is the end of the hands-on tutorial here. I am going to hand it off. I believe Dan is presenting next. Julie, yes. um, there's a couple of uh, points I put in the chat that I wanted to, to mention here. Um, oh, so we discovered, uh, John I discovered yesterday that um, the variables to set the OBS window were actually incorrect in this file. So instead of pb to nc window begin and window end, it should be pb to nc ops window begin and end. Oh, thank you. Um, and that that's incorrect in the in the user's guide as well. So that needs to be updated. Um, <clears throat> but changing those variables should give you the correct window values. Thank you so much for pointing that out. I appreciate that. And I believe is it is it Dan presenting next? Are you ready? To go? Yeah. Hi, Julie. Um, thanks. So let me get set up here. And uh, my name is Dan Adrianson. I work on the Met Plus team at NCAR, and I apologize for my voice. Um, try to do my best this morning. <clears throat> um, I'm going to get my screen sharing set up, and. Get the presentation for ASCII to NC um, on the screen. Okay, can everybody see the uh, full screen slides there? Yes, I can see them. Okay, thanks, Jewel. Um, so this will be talking about the MET tool ASCII to NC and also a little bit about Python embedding um, for a point. Uh, observation data. Um, John Halley Gottway showed this slide um, as well. It's the uh, overview of the MET a suite of utilities for version 10.0.0. And on the left are um, gray boxes indicating input data sources. And I've highlighted the red path that we're going to be talking about today, which is using um, ASCII point data as input via the ASCII to NC tool, which writes a NetCDF um, point data format that's able to be read by um, several of the MET tools in the vertical um, red rectangle uh, further to the right. So what is the ASCII to NC tool? Um, it's pretty uh, self-explanatory. Uh, it stands for ASCII to N NetCDF. Um, and its functionality is, is sort of threefold. It, it reformats ASCII point observations into an intermediate NetCDF format. Uh, again, that, that the MET tools are able to um, read um, the ASCII to NC tool supports uh, multiple different ASCII formats. It supports a generic um, MET-specific 11-column format, which we'll show in the next slide. Um, but there's also a few other formats, little r, surfrad, um, WWSIS, and Aeronet data as well. Um, there's a configura configuration file that's optional <coughs> Excuse me, to define uh, time summaries and message type mappings for the little r format, and we won't go over that today. Um, and the data formats it supports are, are several there, and it writes this uh, NetCDF uh, output data. 
um, which is input to point stat and ensemble stat. So here's the 11 column format um, uh, ASCII file representation of point data um, that ASCII to NC can read. Um, and so the gray shaded area is what the actual ASCII file would look like. Um, these column names at the top are added here for um, ease of interpretation. Um, and I've summarized um, each of the columns in an English description or a more um, human readable description um, of the data uh, in the second column below. And these, these um, items are pretty straightforward and are detailed and, and more, um, more detailed in the Met User's Guide. Um, but you can see it's, it's pretty um, self-explanatory here, just a station ID, uh, a message type. John detailed that a little bit in his uh, prep buffer presentation. Uh, time, uh, position, altitude, or elevation, um, a variable name, uh, a string, or a grid code, uh, a level, um, height, and some quality control and the actual value of the observation. So let's talk a little bit about Python embedding um, and, and the power that it has for, for your point data. Um, it really opens the possibility to support an, an endless uh, set of file formats with, within MET, um, provided that you, the user, um, have a way to read the data with Python. Um, but not only does it allow you to support different formats, it allows you to do uh, myriad different things to your data prior to calling the MET tools, like cleaning your data, um, formatting your data, um, creating derived fields or applying calculations to your data, um, all within your Python framework um, before you feed the data into MET. Um, the Python embedding has the additional advantage of reducing or eliminating um, intermediate data files on disk. So you saw that um, ASCII to NC writes out a temporary NetCDF file, but with Python embedding, um, the handoff of the data occurs in memory uh, on the computer and doesn't require an intermediate file. And for point data, um, the Python embedding leverages the powerful, uh, popular, and well-supported Python module called Pandas. So what does Python embedding look like um, with ASCII to NC in the most basic use case? Well, the Python replaces the reading and formatting actions that occur within ASCII to NC to create the 11-column um, uh, NetCDF file representation. I've linked the use case here that this references, which is a very, very simple demonstration of using Python embedding with the ASCII to NC tool. There's three important MET plus configuration options that you need to set in order for this to, um, to work. And I just detailed those here, but I've also provided the MET translation. So if you're more familiar with using MET tools, um, what a call to ASCII to NC might look like um, on the command line versus uh, configuring it via MET plus. So what is the Python embedding actually doing? Um, so when you run this use case, um, MET plus starts ASCII to NC, um, which actually invokes your Python script. And the Python script here in the use case example reads ASCII data, but it could also read other data as well um, into Python. It creates a pandas data frame, which conforms to the MET 11 column format, and it hands off the data to the MET tool in memory, in this case, ASCII to NC. So on the bottom, I have this diagram of what this looks like on the left without Python embedding, where you actually just call ASCII to NC, it reads your ASCII data, and it writes out a point in that CDF file. In the lower right, I, I highlight how this works a little bit differently, where the Python script is actually invoked, it reads in your input data, sends it to ASCII to NC, which does the writing to the net CDF file for this use case. You'll note that I've crossed out ASCII in this particular diagram in the lower right, um, and even though you're using ASCII to NC, you could, in theory, use any data format that's supported by reading um, via Python, in your case, to get the uh, NetCDF file that comes out of ASCII to NC. It does not have to be ASCII format in this particular case. So a little bit about the Python layer details. Um, this uh, screen grab here is of the um, Python script that's highlighted in the yellow text here which is included with the local um, installation of the MET software. So it's in MET scripts, Python, read ASCII point.py. Um, I encourage you to look at that um, if you have time, but I've highlighted the two relevant sections uh, that are important to understand what's going on in the Python script. Um, the first is just 
if you start with this script for your application, it has a handy reference guide for what the columns need to be called in your data plane or in, um, how you're uh, asking your whatever input data you're using needed to have the 11 columns. And then the blue section in this case, um, this example is just using a simple um, space delimited ASCII file. So um, we use the pandas read CSV function um, with a space delimiter. It creates a data frame, assigns the column names to it, and converts it into a list and hands it off to Met. The important details here is that any uh, Python script you use, the data that you have point that you hand off to Met or you want to send to Met must be in the Python list and it must have the name point data. Those are the two most critical things. If those two requirements aren't met, um, then Matt won't be able to, um, to find your data. So I'm sure some of you who are maybe more familiar with this are sitting here wondering, well, do you really need ASCII and C for this use case? Well, not really. Um, this use case is a, a most general basic demonstration of Python embedding four point data. All it's doing is simply taking an ASCII file, <clears throat> running a Python script to read it, and writing out a MetNet CDF file. So really, if you desire the MetNet CDF representation of the point data, then certainly this, this is a, a good application or a good demonstration of that. If you don't need that and you just want to hand off data to another Met tool like PointStat or EnsembleStat, then this diagram on the lower right is probably a, a more realistic um, point observation workflow where the Python script is called, reads in data, formats it to, to what Met expects, and hands it off to Met or uh, point stat or ensemble stat for a verification task. And so <clears throat> I just wanted to revisit this diagram from the very beginning because this shows you um, where your Python script lives. So if you follow the red diagram there, I've replaced this yellow box. This Python script sits in between your data and the Met tool um, and it sort of eliminates these, um, these reformatting uh, applications in, that, in this particular case. So a summary of Python embedding for point data, um, MetPlus provides a very simple example use case, which is what we described here of Python embedding. Um, there are more advanced Python embedding example use cases um, available at MetPlus. And um, the Python embedding functionality really creates this big opportunity for users to um, bring data sets or, or derive things that, that weren't previously possible. And so we really encourage users to leverage this capability for their workflows and data sets. So I'm going to take a brief pause, check the chat, get something to drink, and we'll revisit for the uh, 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 hands-on tutorial. Hey, John HG. This is John Opatz. Um, could you comment on Deanna's, uh, Deanna Spindler's uh, question about, is there some way to request one particular type of data encoded in prep buffer report type? Um, they they indicate things like ship buoy and seaman tide gauges. Yeah, so in the um, PB to NC configuration file, there is a report type um, option where you can explicitly specify what report types to retain. By default, it's empty. So that means that all of them are retained. Um, but yeah, if you look, I, I would just direct you to the um, to the Met user's guide, the PBDNC configuration section, and you can, you can see the um, report type options there. Uh, whether or not, so those are, to my knowledge, those are pretty lightly used. I don't know if it is currently configurable via Met Plus or not, but um, this, if it isn't, then this would be an option where you could use the the uh, Met Plus overrides um, setting to um, specify that. Thanks, John. Appreciate the answer. Okay, um, John, thanks for uh, addressing Perry's question in the chat. Um, and Tara, thanks for the info on the Python embedding um, and, and MetPlus version 4.10. So um, I've added the link to the um, ASCII to NC hands-on section, um, which we'll be going over now. 
and we'll be able to try some Python embedding. So <clears throat> at the top of the um, uh, hands-on uh, practical session here, um, just like Julie went over um, for PBNC, there's um, some reminders here about setting your environment. Um, and there's a link here to that information if you haven't already done that. Um, I linked to a couple um, important uh, reference materials here, which I'm not going to go over today. Um, but I just want to point out that the Met Users Guide um, has important information about ASCII to NC. Um, and Met Users Guide Appendix F is really critical for learning about Python embedding. All the details you would need to know um, are available in there. And the Met Plus Configuration Glossary is linked here as well. So for this use case, um, we're going to focus mostly on the Python embedding aspect of it and trying to um, see how this all fits together and give you, the users, an opportunity to actually modify one of these Python scripts to see, um, to, to sort of feel what it feels like to have your Python code be run by Met. So um, for step one, what we'll do is let's view the template Python embedding scripts that are available with Met. So the command here um, we'll copy and we will paste um, into our command line. And you can see that there are um, five different um, template scripts that are used um, for various use cases and various applications of Python embedding. And the one we're going to be looking at today um, is called read ASCII point. And that's the one that we just talked about in the presentation. So that's the Python script that's used with Python embedding. So let's look at the data, um, the, the data that that Python script is reading. So in step two, um, let's inspect a sample of the accumulated precipitation point data um, being read with Python. So we'll just look at a, at a quick dump of the, um, uh, the first few lines of the file. And you can see that this data, again, this is for demonstration purposes only. So it's nicely formatted in the 11 column format. All the information is there um, and it's uh, space delimited. Um, and you know what, looking at this now, I'm not sure this is accumulated precipitation, um, but uh, anyways, uh, it could be various uh, data types actually, because they have seven, 11 and 17 here. So it looks like it's varying data types for this case. I'll, I'll change that uh, information in a little bit. Um, so let's, um, we looked at what scripts are available. We looked at the data that's being read. Let's actually look at the Python script in step three. So we'll just um, dump out the Python script to the command line to see um, what it looks like. And again, um, we looked at this in the presentation a little bit, <clears throat> but I just wanted to again point out that um, it, this has a reminder section. These uh, uh, pound symbols uh, are comments in Python code. So these lines are not executed by Python. This is just a reminder to tell you what each of the columns is supposed to be. And it also tells you the data type the, that it's expecting. On these lines here, um, in the blue highlighting, we're using the pandas read CSV to open up the, the data we just looked at, which is space delimited and um, assigning the column names and the types um, to each one of the columns and then converting it to a list. So this last little piece that I'm highlighting is really important um, because Matt won't take a data frame object. Um, you have to convert the data frame to a Python list um, prior to Matt being able to use it. So we'll go on to step four, which is to actually run the use case and see what happens. So we'll copy and paste that into the command line. And it should go, yes, here it goes. And it's pretty quick um, on the machine um, I'm running on. And it says at the bottom, uh, Met Plus has whoops, successfully finished running. Um, so let's make sure that our output file exists. In step five, <clears throat> we'll copy the command to list the output directory. And there is our netcdf file. So you can inspect this netcdf file with typical netcdf tools like ncdump, um, and, but um, it does follow a very specific format that Met uses. And so um, it might not be very intuitive 
um, uh, to inspect. So that just de demonstrates how the Python script that comes with MET is called via MET plus, reads the ASCII data and creates the NetCDF file. So let's try and actually write some Python code. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that uh, script that comes with the MET installation, we're gonna copy it to our working directory, we're gonna copy the MET plus use case configuration file to our working directory, we're gonna edit the Python script to print a, a statement um, within it, and then we're gonna review the log file and prove that our Python code was run. So let's first copy the uh, MET plus use case configuration file to our working directory. In step six, um, then the next thing we'll do is copy the Python embedding script to our working directory. And then we're gonna open up <clears throat> this Python embedding script um, that we just copied with a text editor of our choice. I'll use Vim, and we'll go to line 34, and we will copy and paste this print statement, and we will make sure the indentation matches the previous line, um, just like that. So I'll pause for a second. People are editing, and copying, and pasting. Just give a second for anyone following along to catch up. Okay. And now we're going to modify the MET plus use case configuration file to actually use that Python script instead of the one that comes with the MET install. So now we'll open up the ASCII to NC use case configuration file and a text editor of our choice. I'll copy the path here. And we'll go down to line 108. <clears throat> and we will modify the ASCII to, uh, ASCII to NC input template to use the Python script that we just edited. So let's see. I can probably just delete that line and replace it with this one. go so this is what mine looks like now my my new line 108 so we're still going to use the same sample ascii data but we're using a different python script one that we've edited and put a print statement in so we can prove um, that we're actually using our own python code so we'll save that <clears throat> and now we will rerun the use case and this command is different um, than before. So make sure you copy the command in um, step eight and paste it instead of using your uh, terminal history. So we'll run this. It says MetPlus has successfully finished running. That's good. But what we really wanna know is did our print statement come out of the Python script? And the way we check that is by looking at the MET plus log file here. Now, this log file, you're going to have to edit to match your particular um, file name because the timestamp is written to the MET plus log file. So your timestamp will be different um, than mine. So I will just copy everything up to the last uh, dot in the file name and then use a tab complete in my browser, or not my browser, my uh, terminal window. And okay, that didn't work. Added some escape characters for some reason. Ugh. Okay. Dan, I think your timestamp is different from what was printed up above. Right. Yeah. So I we we've, we've run it twice. So um, everyone should have two log files, and we want to look at the latest one. Um, so we ran it once with the default Python script, and once with the Python script we just edited. So let's copy the most recent one, which in this case is 944.06 for me, and we'll paste that, and then copy the rest of this command here. And the the second and last log output or screen output, 
list list the full path to the log file that was generated from that run. Ah, so you thank you, George. Out. Yes, yes. So right here from running it, um, it says check the log file for more information. So why don't we just copy that? Yes, thank you, George. Excellent. And here is the log file. So if we look through here, we will see there's a line that says, hello, creating pandas data frame of point obs. So congratulations, you have written your first Python embedding script for Met. <clears throat> and hopefully this example um, was useful and um, you know allows you to get the feel for how this all goes together and um, show some output from your Python code. So I'll take any questions. I'm gonna check the chat um, and see here. Stop sharing. Okay. Ah, okay, thanks, John, <clears throat> for answering Philip's question. Um, okay, um, I don't see any other questions. Um, I, I'm available uh, to hang on for a few minutes if folks wanted to have any, um, you know, live questions. Um, I'm willing to take any of those. And thanks for listening and following along. Oh, okay. Austin has a question. Um, for point data, the answer is yes, I believe. John can confirm, <clears throat> but I believe for point data, it, uh, it, it has to be a Python list. Yes. John, is that? Yeah, sorry, but um, yeah, the so right now the, you know, our 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 Python embedding support um, works, but it's it's kind of our still our initial implementation of it. I think as it gets more widely used and more traction, we're looking for feedback from users for how to make it more uh, flexible and useful. So um, if if uh, as you're working with it, you think, boy, if if, if it could just do this, we could just support that. Then please post an idea to discussions to to get the discussion going. Yeah, I mean it seems one obvious uh, thing here would be to just natively support the data frame, um, but um, you know that that's just one example of what John's talking about. Not necessarily anything we're considering. <laughs> Yeah, and the way so what actually happens is you know python stores there, there's memory stored in python and then the met c plus plus code goes and accesses that memory and so um that's why it's rather rigid right now because um, getting the c plus plus code to read from memory is rather um uh you have to do it precisely correctly um in order in order to make it work um it isn't it, it that the that embedded uh, compiled uh, embedded support um, is rigid, um, so that's that's why. Well, okay, so we have um, eleven minutes left before the end of the hour. Are there other questions that folks want to raise? Um, or or shall we just end early? If you'd like to ask a question, please uh, go ahead at this time. Uh, if we got a bunch of them, then you could also raise raise your hand and uh, take turns. I mentioned in the chat. Um, let me let me, since we have a, since we have a moment. Let me present my screen again. Um, I mentioned in the chat this verification data sets guide. So let me take you to that um, to show that off for a moment. So if you go to the Met Plus uh, documentation, so this is where the uh, you know the, the the top level landing page and read the docs for the Met Plus users guide. You'll notice on the left side there's a users guide, there's a contributors guide, um, the release guide or is basically the instructions we follow when we create a new new release of the software packages um you know this one with this one guide contains instructions for all the met plus components 
And the last one in the list is the verification data sets guide. And I'd say this is probably the new, newest piece of documentation that we have. Our, our goal here is, you know, across the MET plus use cases, there's a variety of, we use a variety of different input data sets. And uh, knowledge about that data sets is rather uh, scattered. You know, there's there are certain people who know a lot about uh, one data set or another, but there's it's it's kind of difficult to find um, a, a good resource to to collect all these together. So you can see here that we have uh, existing documentation for 15 different data sets that are that are useful for verification. So obviously, this is not a comprehensive list. Our goal here is that as we add new use cases to Met Plus we check to see if the data being used in those use cases has been documented yet or, 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 uh, already or not. And if not, add them to the list. So for each data set, like for example, I was talking about PREPA for data. So GDAS is the global data simulation system. This is the PREP buffer uh, data set that is, uh, that is, that's part of that data simulation system. So um, the, it, for each data set, we list a top level description of it how it might be useful for verification, what the file format is, um, one or more locations of where you can retrieve this data. We note if there's any access restrictions, like if it's um, restricted or unrestricted, a uh, general uh, description of the spatial resolution or grid or coverage of the data, tempor temporal resolution, beginning and ending dates, and um, data latency. So is it available in real time or is there some delay? description of what variables are, are available uh, in this data set. And then um, how, how, do, how is this data used in existing MetPlus use cases? So I'll click on this link. So you'll notice that we've tagged this with a uh, data set descriptor, VX data GDAS prep. And I believe, so fingers crossed, that will take us to the list of the use cases that make use of this data. Although I don't know that that is if whether or not this is actually working. Oh, here we go. So VX data, it was GDAS prep. So here we go. Here are here's here's some of them um, that where where this shows up. Actually, I don't know. Let me try that. So here's one here's one use case that makes use of that data. Or no, this is just showing me the <laughs> taking me back to the description of the data. Anyway, so more work to be done on that integration, but um, that's the idea of this data sets guide. And I think it would, I think it would benefit, um, all of us to, to, you know, add more information here. Okay. So no other questions have come in on the chat. If that's the case, we'll go ahead. oh, go ahead, George. And there's uh, one question from Austin about Python embedding and will the return to met always be a Python list? Yeah, I addressed that out loud, but I, I can type oh, it in the chat if we need something for, for posterity. Uh, should I do that? Should I add it to the chat? Or Sure, go ahead, Dan. Thanks. Hey, um, uh, I, I do have another question. <clears throat> go ahead, Nelson. Or should I type it in? Would it be better if I type it in? No, it's fine. Go ahead. Okay. So the uh, that list of verification data set, is that a list that is contained with the, uh, you know, when you install the various Met packages, or is that something that we go out and get on our own? Well, uh, yeah, good question. So in the the, so what we were looking at, let me let me bring up, let me share again. A list of one to fifteen. Yeah. Data sets. Yes. So let me show you how how all this works. Um, so here we're looking at this, the Met Plus documentation, right? And the Met Plus documentation consists of four things, and one of them is the verification data sets guide. And this is being served up via read the docs. Now the source for those for these documentation components actually live within the Met Plus repository. So here I am in the Met Plus repository. I'm going to go to the develop branch because that has kind of the latest development towards the next release. You'll see in the top level directory there's a docs directory. If I click in there, you'll see that here are four, the, the, those, the, the source, basically the source information, the source code for those four pieces of documentation that's being served up by, via read the docs. So here's the verification data sets. You know, here's the, 
th this is this is distributed uh, or stored as restructured text. That's what the RST means. Um, that's the that um, this suffix. So here is basically the contents of of all of our documentation. It actually lives with the code, and it's served up and formatted nicely via uh, read the docs. So it is true that the when you clone the Metro Plus repository, um, you will get all of the uh, all of the content that's served up via those via the documentation. It just won't be formatted as nicely as it is formatted via read the docs. Or awesome. Were you talking about um, like getting that actual the actual data sets that are referred to there, or or about that just the information in the documentation? I, I was wondering if the actual data themselves were uh, part of the uh, release, like when you install different parts of MetPlus. Are those like sample verification data sets that come with your install? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I wasn't answering the right question. Thanks, Julie. Um, no, this, these, this list of 15 data sets uh, is basically this is kind of a description of the data that's used by the existing MetPlus use cases. So George, why don't I hand it off to you to talk about the sample input data sets that are used by the MetPlus use cases. George, are you able to talk about that? Yeah. Okay. We could, you know, if it's getting too late, we could uh, bring it up next time. I, I don't want to, you know, cause you to go over the, the a lot of time. Um, I can just briefly uh, touch on it. Um, so the, the sample data that's provided um, for the each example um, is hosted on our DT Center webpage. Um, on each release, there should be a link to, um, to find that data set. Um, and then they're organized by different versions and then by different use case categories. So all of the um, use cases that are under the Met Tool wrapper section have one set of data for all of those examples. And then all of the different model applications have an individual tar file for the data for each of those categories that are found under there. Um, so the sort of the data uh, directory structure of the use case param file sort of governs where, uh, which which sample data you'll need to obtain to, to run the examples. Um, yeah, if you click, uh, let's see. I think if you just click this MetPlus 4.0.0 button, that should take you to the GitHub releases page. Yep. And then here there's a link to the 4.0 data. So if you click there, so here you have all these um, tar files that are um, that correspond to each of the categories of use cases to run. I see. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, and we actually use uh, those input data sets in our automated uh, regression testing when we do new development. So every time we submit a pull request to merge changes into Met Plus, um, we our continuous integration step uses those data sets to run all of our existing use cases and make sure that we get the same we get the same output that we got in the previous version. So, um, so it's it's pretty nice how those these these are all all work together. And one big advantage to contributing a use case back to Met Plus is that then we'll add that to the list of things we test, so that we'll we make sure that your use case once added will will continue to produce the output uh, that we expect. All right, we're right at ten o'clock then. So thanks everyone. Um, for for calling in today, and we will talk to you again next week.